Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street from Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He's editor of the Hattrick Letter at goldenjackass.com. Thank you for joining us again, Jim Willey. A uh, pleasure to be on, Jason. So much happening, as usual. <laughs> yeah, I mean, since we last talked in uh, around Thanksgiving in November, um, there's just been black, black swan after black swan after black swan. Uh, we had we had the, the stuff come out with the uh, Swiss pegging which I guess they had, you know, the inside information that the European Central Bank was going to actually start printing money. So we had the European Central Bank QE, Swiss depegging, and, um, you know, a number of other ev events occur. But um, the main thing that I think is happening since then is we've just seen the U.S., I guess, basically declare economic warfare on Vladimir Putin and Russia. Why is the U.S. intentionally poking the bear? The United States is targeting in a major foreign policy directive manner any nation that wants to discard the dollar. And the Russians weren't actually discarding treasury bonds in their banking system. They were working toward a created, creating a, a trade system with settlement outside the dollar. So... You're getting a long list now. It's Iraq, Iran, uh, Russia, and, and there'll be more nations that don't want to use the dollar in trade settlement. When you talk about the global reserve dollar or the dollar as you know, king dollar in, in global trade and, and usage around the world, there are really two functions. One is settling trade between countries, you know, two countries trade this amount one direction, x, x one direction, y the other direction, so it must settle as x minus y. It's positive on one side, it's negative on the other. Well, how does it get settled? Well, you know, these things are, are taken for granted by a lot of Americans, and it is the essence of war right now. The Russians have been working on establishing the Eurasian trade zone. The Russians have been working watching closely, let me say, the Iran prototype method, where India bought Iranian oil, but they paid for it with Turkish supplied gold. Now, that's a three-way brilliant system with an intermediary of Turkey for oil for gold. And Russia liked it. Well, as they made more progress with the BRICS alliance nations, it's not just Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa anymore. It, the alliance is, I believe, over 100 nations now, something like 115 nations that say, yeah, we will follow your lead. It, it's like the entire anti-West in a coalition. Uh, you, you take the Western major industrial nations, almost all the rest – our BRICS alliance nations. So the United States saw the Europeans, in particular Germany, uh, working closer and closer and closer with Russia and China. Now, most Americans don't know, but there are between three and 5,000 German companies working in Russia with active trade. Most Americans don't know that most, the biggest slice of imports on, on the capital side are German in China. Germany imports German, I'm sorry, China imports German equipment. Um, it, it's, it's getting very, very serious. And I, I think the United States re recognized two or three years ago, I think around the same time they installed QE, I think QE is a suicide pact. When QE was installed, the rest of the world said, oh, no, we can't have a reserve banking system based in the dollar when the United States and the dollar are being backed by printed money. We can't do this. will not stand. So the QE accelerated all the BRICS movement toward a gold currency. QE accelerated all the the work for the Eurasian trade zone, which is far more than just Russia and China. It's far more than Russia, China, and the old former Soviet republics. No, that's going to form its nucleus. 
that's that's like the the knee jerk. Well, obviously they will take up the, this Eurasian trade zone. But now you're getting enormous infrastructure commitments, and and I think when when the South Stream for Gazprom out of Russia, when it was in the construction stage, which it still is now, it's it's turning into a, a pipeline not through Ukraine but through Turkey. They're calling it Turk Stream now. But when when that planning came about two or three years ago, it had to go through Hungary and Bulgaria and Serbia. And and these little nations are all being lined up by the United States. I call it bribery and I get corrected. Some say, no, it's not bribery. These are corporate contracts. I think the contracts are being used as bribery because take a look at who's behind the contracts and you see companies, shell companies and other companies with uh, Vice President Biden's son involved with Hillary involved, with Kerry involved, with McCain involved. They get a lot. Of, I think they have some shadow shell corporations that are looking to heavily profit from any diversion of the Gazprom pipeline. I mean, this is scummy stuff. So, you know, why did the U.S. go after Russia? Because they don't want the dollar anymore. Why would any nation with an IQ above the Bush level of, you know, 80, 85, why would any nation whose finance ministers and prime ministers and parliamentary leaders, why would any nation want to hang on to treasury bonds in their banking system or trade, settle and trade with the dollar? Banking system with treasury bonds, trade with the dollar. Those two are always inseparable. Why would any nation want to continue when QE is installed with hyper-monetary inflation? Hey, look. I took economics courses in the 70s. I studied more economics in the 80s. I read Wall Street Journal and Barron's in the 80s a lot, in the 90s a lot. I learned a lot on my own and in, in college courses. Everywhere you turned, it was, well, hyperinflation destroys capital. Hyperinflation is very negative. It's caustic. It's corrosive. So why is it called stimulus and positive when we do it? I, th I think that's just how the Keynesians label things, uh, Jim. Uh, the way Keynes labeled things is um, they're o almost always like the exact opposite of reality. So, and the government programs are like that too now, you know, with like the, uh, <laughs> the Patriot Act, you know, it's the exact opposite of reality. So like it takes away rights instead of, you know, about patriotism. And, you know, a lot of the government programs are, are like that, like the Affordable Care Act, right? It's not really affordable because the price goes up now. Um, they can jack up the price uh, through cronyism, you know, 10, 20 percent or more per year. So it's just it's just Orwellian, I guess, in nature, the way they uh, they label these types of, of programs. But the, the stuff that's going on in Russia, I mean, the economic warfare, it, it just seems like it's out of a spy novel. Um, it's like almost out of a James Bond movie or a spy novel. Now, you know, we have these um, uh, the Jack Ryan shadow recruit movie. I don't know if you saw that. Sure. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you saw that movie recently, but it was kind of based on like currency wars and um, the book and things like that. And it was the U.S. against Russia. So, you know, it was the Russians planning to destroy the United States stock market and crash the market. But, um, you know, the U.S. is doing these types of things. We've seen, uh, I think, the U.S. government order the uh, American debt rating agencies, which are S&P and Moody's. They've ordered them to downgrade Russian debt. Uh, we've seen the, the Russian currency, the Russian ruble was attacked drastically. There's just been enormous volatility in currencies that never happens. Norm normally like a 2% move maybe per day. In currencies is enormous, but we've had, you know, enormous moves in the Swiss franc, the euro, and the Russian ruble, and the Japanese yen. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just really interesting. And then also the latest one out of Russia is the politician dying, Putin's rival. I mean, Putin is considered – he's not the nicest guy, but he's considered, you know, a very smart chess player. Why – when his population um, – when his, uh, uh, his ratings for political support, I think he has an 85% – popular rating, why why would he take out his rival? It just doesn't make any sense to me. No, I don't think he did. I don't think he did any more than, I don't, I don't think a lot of the U.S.-based violent incidents, I don't want to get into the actual names and events, but in a general sense, I don't think those string of violent incidents inside the United States that have had huge political repercussions, I don't think they were natural endemic events. I would think they were staged. So, you know, just like the snowplow murder of uh, De Margerie, Total Oil Energy firm out of France, 
Just because it happens inside Russia doesn't mean Russians did it. <clears throat> I mean, U.S. has got all kinds of people in, located inside Russia. You know, I don't think, okay, you, you mentioned the, the Jack Ryan Shadow Recruit. That it was, it was a, you know, an interesting movie. I, I, I always do a, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to sound like a, like a little kid here, but I, I always do a little bit of giggling when I watch the movie. Like, oh, yeah, you're yeah, right, right. And, and actually, I, I get my, my gal uh, laughing sometimes so hard she pees in her, her cinema chair because I, I have this little habit of mine when something is very far-fetched, like, for instance, Jack Ryan breaking into the building, the high-secure corporate building, and <laughs> eluding all the different sensory devices and all the different hitmen and all the different bodyguards. I have a little thing I do. I go, I'm bullshit. <laughs> in the theater. And it's kind of funny because they don't speak uh, English in, in San Jose, Costa Rica. But, you know, who who's wrecking the treasury bond? Who's wrecking the dollar? It's the Fed with their QE and it's the Department of Treasury with their debt issuance. It's the Congress for relaxing the debt limit. We're doing it. We're killing the dollar, and then we're going to war with anyone who objects. This is how yep. you accelerate, Jason, the dollar's death. And that's what I'm seeing right now. Acceleration of, of death of the dollar, rejection of the dollar globally, uh, a breakdown of all the different financial structures behind the petrodollar. You know, when we got rid of the, the Bretton Woods gold uh, standard, if you will. It's hard to call it a standard. It was pretty much a standard, but okay, it had some loose elements to it in 1971. When we abrogated it, it was just two years that we created a new one. The dollar standard, well, with the asset backing the dollar was crude oil, black gold. And I don't want to get into the whole thing, but I've come to learn that Kissinger was the emissary to the Saudis to suggest that they quadruple the oil price. They did not act unilaterally. They acted on Rockefeller's suggestion. So we wanted to create the new gold standard, the black gold standard. All right, that's all being torn apart now. And you know, one of the most common questions I get is why is the dollar rising in an exchange rate? I, I have a hard time calling it, you know, being valued higher. No, 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 not at all. You know, if, uh, you know, if, if a guy is, is dying from a, a bloated, uh, a bloated chest cavity, you know, having his, his, his face taped shut and he starts floating, it doesn't mean he's rising or flying. It means the cadaver is floating. So we have the cadaver of the dollar doing an elevation based on the destruction of its very high number of Forex contracts that link the currencies to crude oil. They're all being dissembled. They're all being deconstructed. They're being liquidated. And as they're being liquidated, they're denominated in dollars. So there's some de dollar demand to pay off the holders of the contracts. And I point to the example. You know, it's amazing, Jason. We, we see all these wonderful examples of past crisis. And, and the, the supposedly smart people out there, the ones who are, what do they call it, shaping thought, they don't learn a damn thing. In, the, in 2009, we had the crude oil price descend from something like 110 down to something like 40. Was that because the demand went down or the supply went up? No, it was because the petrodollar derivatives got mangled. But they got fixed again. This time, they're not going to get fixed again. I wouldn't be at all surprised, and the voice set, set this message, um, that the, the crude oil price, the official price, is going to go down even lower. Uh, he, uh, it, it, it's, it's very difficult to put numbers on it, but don't be at all surprised if we go down a couple more ratchets, a couple more significant quantum jumps down. On the oil price. Why? Because we're not done dissembling, destroying, and taking apart, liquidating the Forex 
derivative contracts linked to the crude oil price. And, and when people tell me, oh, gosh, look what the Americans are doing. They're bringing the oil price down to, to harm Russia. What morons? I mean, you've you got to be an actual dumbass to believe this stuff. So the United States and Wall Street, all the different uh, maestros of finance are bringing down the oil price in order to earn the anger and wrath of the Rockefellers? I don't think so. What kind of stupidity is this? No, what happened is probably Russia did a head nod with China who went to Saudi land and together they decided let's wreck the OPEC competitors and, and we wouldn't really do a lot of harm to the Arab Emirates because their cost is already quite low like the Saudis. But for some odd reason, the Iranian oil price, oil costs, uh, are, are substantially higher than the Saudis. So the Chinese and the Saudis said, let's knock down the oil price, harm the OPEC competitors, maybe harm Iran too, but let's harm, let's wreck the U.S. and Canadian shale oil marginal producers that are really producing quite a significant amount. Let's shut them down. And then you get the just moronic propaganda coming out of Wall Street, Wall Street Journal, etc., that the U.S. is behind moving the oil price down. No, it's moronic to think that they're going to wreck the Rockefellers. It's, it's, there's more to it. I just want to mention a, two events in passing without really focusing much on it, Jason, if you don't mind. The Russians have demonstrated with a significant slice of scientific caliber in the audience, the effectiveness of cold fusion. They've legitimized it and put it on the map finally. In other words, the Rockefellers can't suppress it anymore. The second thing is Toyota has made available for free its entire book of patents for fuel cell driven cars. And we see some F estimates that 20% of all the cars by the year 2020 will be electric. Look for a slice of it to be fuel cell. So, again, the Rockefellers can no longer suppress advanced carburation, burning of seawater, and other devices to power cars. We're seeing the end of the old crude oil dependence in our global society. So that might be part of what's going on, because if the Rockefellers divested over 80 percent of their oil assets, which is what I've heard they've done, then I would imagine the oil price is going to go down some more. So, again, we're going after Russia because they don't want the dollar anymore. Well, neither does China, but we're not going after them because they hold, what, $1.3 trillion, supposedly, of treasury bond debt? No. I don't think they own anywhere near that, but they own a few hundred billion. I think the Chinese lie on two things, the official gold reserves and the official treasury bonds held. I think they have far less gold and far more I'm sorry, far less treasure bonds and far more gold. The, the, the Chinese have nothing to, that they owe to the United States for telling the truth because we, we've reneged on just about everything possible, including all the treaties in the last 100 years. Or is it 200 years? I, I lose track on the U.S. broken treaties. The exceptional nation has the right to break treaties. I get it. I get it. The exceptional nation has the right to distribute counterfeit bonds. I get it. The exceptional nation has the right to wage war with any nation that doesn't want the dollar, which we're destroying through hyperinflation. I get it. Yeah, the, Jim, the, the British Empire, if you go back through financial his, uh, through history, the British Empire did, uh, had exceptionalism like this where they thought that they could do stuff, but when their enemies did it, you know, it was bad, but when they did it, it was fine, and the Romans did the same stuff, you know, with divide and conquer, especially with the U.S.'s uh, foreign policy decisions where sometimes, you know, the U.S. is uh, intervening on both sides in a country, trying to completely destabilize it and create chaos. Oh, you mean like in Iraq? <laughs> yeah. 
Well, the, there's so many examples, yeah. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. The most recent one is Iraq, and it's another kind of a dark topic that I, I don't want to get into too much, but people need to wake the hell up. ISIS is a combination Saudi, Israeli, and Langley project. Funded, supplied, staffed by these three countries. And what's their purpose? To take control of Iraq because we couldn't do it through the parliament. Unbelievable yeah, I've stuff tr- going on here, Jason. It's sickening. I yeah, I've tried to explain. I was told. To some- go ahead. Go ahead. I've tried to explain to some of my friends, um, you know, younger adults, that, you know, um, we basically trained Osama bin Laden, right? And he fought for the U.S. He was CIA trained and financed, and he fought for the U.S. in Afghanistan, right, against the Soviets, and then he turned on us. And then we did, you know, decades before, we did the same thing with Saddam Hussein. I think he, he helped assassinate Mossadegh, right, in Iran. And then we put him in power in Iraq, and he was a puppet of ours, and then we lost control of him, and then he turned on us too. And, you know, most even though the information is well documented all over the place that these things are true, right, um, people won't, people just don't want to believe it, that the U.S. government could do this um, and be involved in politics like this and, and things like that. But we openly admit to assassinating leaders. I, I don't know what's so difficult to believe. We openly admit that we destabilized. We did never denied Operation Gladio which fomented all kinds of violence in, in Europe in the 1970s and 80s, in, in particular in Italy. And, and we never denied Operation P- Paperclip, which was to bring in all the Nazi intelligentsia into the United States and Britain. What's so hard to believe? We, I, we, when I was 11 years old, no, 10 years old, 9 or 10, I can't remember exactly, I saw a film on a documentary of, of how the, the CIA assassinated President DM of Vietnam. And I said to my dad, why is this on TV, Daddy? And he said, well, apparently there's some nasty things going on in the world, Jim. And the world is not always a, a pretty place. I said, but, but we killed DM and then we have a war? Is, is that how we do things? Jim Willie, nine years old. Yeah, and you have more common sense back then than most of the Americans I speak to now who are adults. I mean, I guess they've just been so brainwashed in by the the mainstream media and by the government schools, or they're too busy, you know, uh, watching reality TV or, um, you know, with social media or things like that, you know, watching bad TV, that uh, they either are too stupid to understand any of these things, they're brainwashed, or they don't care. Well, it, it's it's a difficult psychological conclusion to 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 make... A, a decision to make a statement to, to you know to reinforce a construct in your mind that leaders of my country are not good. My military is not to protect me. It, it's out to defend the narcotics business. It, it's out to you know experiment on on weapons in Vietnam, like Agent Orange and all kinds of other things. Uh, my my country and my bankers are not out to protect my my wealth, nor are they even out there to produce capital development. That's a very difficult conclusion to make and to swallow. I, I like to follow up my nine-year-old Jim Willie conclusion about shooting DM and then having the Vietnam War. I, I wasn't on to the fact that the Gulf of Tonkin resolution was a false flag. I, I didn't pick that up for another 30 or 40 years. Sorry. But I did have another epiphany in 1963, age 11. I said to my father, why is the Warren Commission hurrying up to make a conclusion before they really do much of an investigation? 11 years old, Jim Willie. Yeah, I mean, Kennedy, I think Kennedy clearly, like, we weren't told the truth on that. I mean, there's just so many things now that we weren't told the truth on. You know, the Pentagon Papers, that was a false flag, Denny Ellsberg. I actually saw, I didn't tell you this beforehand, but I actually went to a libertarian conference in Washington, D.C., which I live uh, right outside of, and I saw Edward Snowden speak live there for about 30 minutes. So, um, via Google Hangout, you know, over the internet. Uh-huh. So that was that was really interesting here to hear him speak about, um, you know, all the stuff he went through his bosses. So he he he's not this, you know, evil. What the what the mainstream media and the government says, you know, oh, he didn't try to handle this as a proper whistleblower and report it through the proper channels. He went to his bosses, you know, for many many times. And they told him not to put it in writing. They were like, off the record, we agree that what we're doing is illegal, but, you know, we're making 70000 or 100000 or $200,000 a year at our jobs. It's an easy job. 
And, you know, we don't want to jeopardize that. So, you know, stop complaining if you want to work here. And, you know, if you keep uh, rabble rousing with your other coworkers and stuff like that, we're going to start investigating you and fire you and, you know, potentially charge you. Yeah, and take away your passport and put you on lists and maybe a no-fly list and maybe do a few tax audits on you. I mean, there's, it gets sickening. It gets really gets sickening. Well, we're, we're getting off the, the theme of, of finance here, Jason. Why don't, why don't you pick up with uh, the next thing, okay? Sure. Sure. Um, my, my next topic has to do with financial repression. So, you know, we've we've seen the experts, and I'll use that in quotes, um, the Keynesians, the people on Wall Street, you know, everyone last year expected the uh, Fed to, to start raising rates. This year now, I guess, they're doubling down and they expect the, the Fed to be able to start raising rates. But I, I don't think they can because of the, der- the over-the-counter derivatives market and how much interest payments on the debt so um, how long can the U.S., Japan, the United Kingdom, and Europe keep interest rates artificially suppressed with financial repression before interest rates are nor- uh, normalized again? They'll never be normalized again. The dollar is going to vanish before they're normalized. The, the, the Fed can never – I mean, I, I remember this was like it was yesterday, uh, September 2013, all the taper talk. <laughs> and I laughed. I didn't giggle. I laughed openly. I mean, it was high-volume laughter. It was a trial balloon. Well, how'd that work out with the financial markets? Well, they, they, they went into a conniption. They went into, you know, defibrillation. What do you got? Defibrillation. They went into heart attack. Uh, you even had bond market problems. So when they took that away and finally admitted in, in late 2000, and I think it was maybe around October of 2013, in June they started the taper talk, May and June, and then September, October of 2013, they admitted, no, 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 we're, 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 we're not really that serious about tapering. No, no, we, 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 we can't do that. All right, obviously you can't do that. All right, here's why. Here's why. It's really simple. There are three major reasons why. First, they need the free money at 0% in order to use it as a feeder system into the interest rate swap device, the derivative. They shove in 0% money. They, they do the, the – it's a, a very elaborate – I don't want to get into all the details. To be honest, I don't understand it 100%. I, I like to say I understand 50 to 60% of it. But it, it's an arbitrage of short-term treasury bills versus long-term treasury bonds. It requires – the free money to go in as input, and out comes artificial treasury bond demand. Now, they did $8.5 trillion worth of this crap in the last half of 2010 when you had a big bond rally at the same time the U.S. government was wrestling with debt limits and austerity spending limits and losing the pristine AAA bond. And that's when Bill Gross came out and said, we're going to see higher interest rates. And he lost the bet, but never told us why. It's because he learned, as I did, we put on interest rate swap derivatives, eight and a half trillion worth. You cannot raise the interest rates on short term like Fed funds unless you want to fracture a $300 trillion tree. Okay, that's one. The second one, after 2009, when they had, you know, the the resolution of the Lehman Brother kill job to save Goldman Sachs, it was pretty clear the Wall Street banks and the big money center banks and the other big banks in the United States, like Wells Fargo and whatever else, they had a hard time making a lot of money with commercial lending because that's when the vicious recession began and has not stopped. So here we are, six years later, the recession has not stopped. I don't pay a twit of attention to the the U.S. government statistics on GDP, economic growth, and all that. (laughs) It's a bunch of rubbish. Okay, so the Wall Street banks banded together and said, look, we need assurances from you, the Fed, that you're not going to raise interest rates because we're going to put on these gigantic bond carry trades. And with it, we can guarantee that you're going to have a nice stable decline 
in your long-term treasury bonds, your, your 10, 30-year maturities. So it's not through an interest rate derivative device. It's through a basic futures contract. Short the short term. You short the treasury bill, which is, you know, it, it could be a three month. It could be a six month, whatever. It doesn't matter. It just has to be low interest rate behind it, backing it up on, on, the, on the instrument from which it is derived. So you short on the contract for treasury bills and you go long the treasury bond. So it's leveraged support for the treasury bond, but it requires no increase in the Fed funds rate. So again, like the interest rate derivative, if the Fed were to raise interest rates on the Fed funds, they would fracture Wall Street. They would kill their multi-trillion dollar carry trader. Maybe it's worth one or two trillion. It's very large. And it's responsible for perhaps half or more of all their profit. Not only would it fracture them with losses, it would force an avalanche with a, a gathering storm. They call it convexity in, in the bond market. It would force the sale through the leverage. Uh, they would liquidate their leveraged arbitrage setup, their strategy. And it would force sales of treasury bonds, which would then force sales and liquidations of more carry trade. They would lose more money. And the last one to liquidate would lose the most money. So there's a rush to do so. They're not going to do it. The third reason they're not going to raise interest rates is the U.S. government debt. First of all, who would buy the debt? Well, they take a look at the actual buyers, and you might have a uh, token amount by China each month. But the large list is gone. It, now it's, it's a tracking exercise of how much did that country dump? How much did France dump? How much did... Norway dump? How much did these little diddly countries dump? How much did Brazil dump? Okay, so they're not buying treasury bonds anymore. You take away the 0% Fed funds and you take away the long bond for its stability. You have all kinds of problems in the bond market, bond losses. All right, you can't do that. No one would buy the U.S. government debt that's devoted into securities. And furthermore, you'd have a giant increase in the borrowing costs. So who's the biggest beneficiary of 0%? U.S. government. They've already got trillion-dollar deficits. That's even with free money. Now, I, I love the phrase free money. Since when is, since when is anything free? You, you can't get free money. You can't get free Oh, how should I say, love and affection from a woman? There's always a hidden cost. You can't get free air. There's always a hidden cost. You've got to filter it. You've got to get the chemtrail crap out of it. No, we're not going to have any increase in interest rates because it would kill the derivatives, kill the Wall Street bond carry trade, and kill the government borrowing finance structure securitization of its deficit What's going to happen first is a vanishing act of the dollar, the global yeah, projection I, I, of the dollar. I, I, yeah, I completely agree um, with that assessment, Jim, of financial repression. I, I think I think the U.S. and Japan and Europe are committed to basically destroying their currencies uh, before they would let interest rates rise significantly. You know, a couple of years ago there was a brief little spike in the treasury market, right? A tiny, uh, a pretty significant spike. But it was only for a month or two, and the, there were all these, you know, closed meetings and meetings with all the large banks and and the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve and Obama, I think, was even there. So it was an emergency meeting, even for a small little interest rate spike. Well, so um, I, I think they're committed to this policy of financial repression and you know keeping the interest rates keep knocking them, you know, throughout the entire rate curve as low as possible, so they don't have to pay any interest, and they're going to do it with um destroying their currency. And I think the, the Japan may be a little bit ahead of the U.S. in this race to the bottom, but, um, you know, they're all going to end up in the same place in the, de in the developed world. When they had those closed door meetings, I think it was early 2011 and late 2010, what came out of that, what I, what I learned uh, from my sources and from my, my colleagues, we put our brains together and came up with some conclusions, what they concluded 
was that out of the meetings was an agreement. We will ramp up all the interest rate derivatives, all the interest rate swaps. We will ramp it up because shortly after that, concurrently with that, you had the eight and a half trillion dollars put on in interest rate swaps by Morgan Stanley, which is the designated derivative bitch. So, you know, this is not complicated. You know, when I hear people make lunatic comments like, well, we're going to have we're going to have to see interest rates go up. I say, really? Have you thought this through? What happens if they do? And they say, well, we have to do it. I said, no, yeah. what will happen if they do? Those people don't even know what an interest rate swap is. I've tried arguing with some of them. They don't even know what it, what it is. <laughs> well, I don't think they know what a bond carry trade is either. It, it was born with the Japanese yen carry trade. They had 0% money back in 91 and 92. So the carry trade on bonds was born in Tokyo. We just copied it. In fact, we, we had another intermediary carry trade called the gold carry trade. Remember in uh, Clinton Rubin in 1994 and five, they, they changed the gold leasing rate to zero. Wherever you have the zero percent, you have the absurd, obscene borrowing that creates the next carry trade. And they all unwind. They all unwind. And when you get to the end of the road, when they, they don't have any new one to unwind, and right now I think we're there because the U.S. Treasury bond carry trade is the last one. There's nothing to replace it. What are you going to do replace? What are you going to replace it with? The euro bond? No, I don't think so. What are you going to replace it with? Chinese instrument? No, they're not interested. They want to go back to gold. No, th th this this is game over because we've at we're at the last bubble. Some people told me about you know six or eight years ago, Jim. I think the housing market's the last bubble. I said no, no, no. The Treasury bond. They said yeah. The, they said the bond market and the currency. But the, the, then they said to me, Jason, it's like nothing is ever learned. The same so somewhat smart people said to me, wait a minute, when the housing market busts, it's going to mean a lot of trouble for the United States, and there'll be no way they can keep their bond at a low rate because it's going to be a lot of deficit. There's going to be a lot of trouble. There's going to be a lot of stimulus. There's going to be a lot of def deficit from stimulus. There's going to be a lot of vicious circles. And I said, no, no, no. You wait. You watch. They'll find a way. They'll use derivatives. They'll use something phony. They'll use all their different mechanisms. Remember, Greenspan boasted of all the financial uh, instruments and mechanisms and engineering, the advanced engineering they had. Right. That's how we have ob obscene trillion dollar chronic debt deficits for the U.S. government, almost no buyers, and a rally in bonds. Explain that without putting into your explanation the derivatives. Try to explain that. You can't. Well, I, I would just I would just go back to the brainwashing of Keynesian economics that that they say that deflation is bad, but deflation to most people, if you don't have debt and you just have savings and you have you, you get increased purchasing power and when the free market is allowed to work, you get higher quality goods and services at lower prices. That's beneficial deflation. It's not, you know, rapid deflation, but that's how that's how things, you know, markets work when they're allowed to work. But the Keynesians just don't want that. You know, they don't any type of deflation is bad or evil, according to the to all the Keynesians and Neo Keynesians and Krugman and all these um these types. So um, it's just they, they, they come from that mindset, Jim. So they're willing to do anything, you know, whether it's new interest rate derivatives or stuff in order to stop deflation, because deflation is, you know, the evil. They, they want inflation. They, you know, inflation is easy for them compared to deflation. They just hate deflation for some reason. Well, take a look at, at what's going on behind the scenes with the Keynesian clowns. I mean, clowns, my favorite word for today. You, you have these busted assets, the bubbles break and you get the, the supposed deflation. I'm sorry, but I, I really don't pay much attention to people who use the word deflation. Now, you, you qualified it, and that's fine. But most people say to me with, with dumb questions, don't you think we're going to get more deflation than inflation? And I say, define each. If you can adequately, I'll give you an answer because I don't want to waste my time with you because you don't seem like you're, you know, above the Bush 80 IQ line. Okay, so when you get busted assets, it's an excuse for the Keynesians and the central bank to print money. Okay, so when you get assets dropping in value, they go to hyperinflation. Hyperinflation is a monetary event. Furthermore, 
When they see their bonds decline, like the subprime mortgage bonds, it's an excuse to print money and to engage again in hyper-monetary inflation. It's a monetary event. Thirdly, when they see all kinds of problems in the economy due to, say, companies going bust, business segments being shut down, liquidation of inventory, you know, one, one of the biggest new industries right now in the United States is managing inventory liquidation. So when you have all these distress signals in the economy, the actual tangible economy, the government steps in and says, we must stimulate on the fiscal side. So what do they do? They don't do anything intelligent. They don't do capital formation, which would be intelligent. Instead, what the government does is they come out and say, let's put money in people's pockets so they can spend. Let's support the consumer. Okay, that's what the morons do. I mean, that's what you might expect out of an African finance minister's office, not Washington. So when the government then does a, their fiscal stimulus, the Fed then says, we have an excuse to do more hyper-monetary inflation. So all these different things, the busted assets, the bonds de bond declines, and, and the product liquidations from shut down businesses – gives the Keynesians an opportunity, an excuse, to print more money and to gauge more in hyperinflation on the monetary side. They like that because it feeds their bond carry trades and other asset arbitrage. They made a lot of money when the oil price went back up to 100 after 2009. They made a lot of money in the arbitrage. They always do. All they want is some predictable movement. And they'll go to the tap, look for the free money, and they'll put it on and invest in what they know will go up, like the crude oil price from 40 back to 100 in 2009 up to 2012. It's easy money. They don't have to work. They go to the office and say, you know, what's the easy trade? What's the no-brainer today? Okay, fine. Let's go have a two hundred dollar lunch. They don't work. Yeah, Jim, that's exactly what um, Keynes himself actually did, and a lot of other economists and the Wall Street cronies. So DC and Wall Street were doing this, you know, after twenty nine. I think um, when before FDR devalued uh, the dollar against gold, you know, revaluing it from um, twenty dollars an ounce to thirty five. Um, you know, Keynes knew that this was going to be the policy, so all the Wall Street insiders were loading up on physical metal outside the U.S. and also buying mining shares. So they knew that they, they recommended this to the government, and then they did it, and then, and then they made a lot of money off the asset bubble while I think they were publicly bashing, you know, owning gold and stuff. So this is just a normal type of racket, you know, where um, when they do have an asset bust, you know, they, they demand more inflation uh, for their asset bubbles because they have the easier access to capital either out of D.C. or out of Wall Street. Right, and we can't borrow at, at one quarter of a percent, but Wall Street sure can to feed their carry trade and to supply their interest rate swap derivative machinery that produces the artificial demand for treasury bonds of the 10 and 30 year variety. I like to point out that uh, in the Great Depression, when that, that cast of uh, of uh, other financial criminals were busy producing propaganda and then placing bets on the opposite side. They used Canada very effectively. That's where they hid their gold, Canada. And now an interesting thing has happened in the last year and a half. Starting around late 2013, I started monitoring uh, Scotia Makata. And Scotia Makata had been a, a rather fine upstanding company, a bullion bank in Toronto, and they were not participating. They were not supplying Wall Street. But so, something happened suddenly in late 2013 where if you took a look at the, the COMEX movement among the main players, you would see movement out of Scotia, Makota, and into Citigroup or Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan. You see shuffling around from those latter three, but you always see it coming out of Scotia. And I started asking a lot of questions and not getting too many answers. And some of my best sources didn't want to talk because uh, they, they were a little too close to what was going on. And they didn't want to get threatened is what it came down to. And then I came to learn, this is just information I, I came across in uh, 
the, the last couple months of, of 2014, we had some mysterious death of the head of Scotia Makota. And it was believed by some of their surviving executives that it was an induced heart attack done by the Langley boys, done by, you know, the Bush crowd. Now, they may not have much of an IQ, but they, they've got a, a standing army of assassins that are very well equipped. I mean, they've got flying drones that are, you know, the size of you know, large mosquitoes, and they inject poison. They've got all kinds of things. They got the simple thing is an injection of uh, potassium to make it look like a heart attack. They've got machines that work at 20 meters range, and if they can get a long enough period of exposure, they can induce a heart attack. They can induce cancer, and that's some of the theory of how Chavez of Venezuela went away. He was exposed to that. But anyway, what I heard was the founder of Scotia Makata had a mysterious, suspicious death. And then all the rest of the executives said, okay, okay, we get the message. We'll supply Wall Street with that very urgently needed gold. So they're going to drain Scotia dry. And they probably have active death threats for their executives. This is what's supporting the dollar, Jason. War, murder, bribery in the Congress, uh, putting into abeyance the debt limit. Why do you put into abeyance the debt limit? Two, two reasons that I can come up with. One is they don't want to cause any problems by breaking it. They don't want to lose a debt rating. They want the issue to go away. And, and second, we already defaulted. China already called it. And there's lots of evidence to back that up. Yeah, Jim, this this level of immorality um, by the people in power, it's 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 leveling the Romans. It's 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 up there. I mean, we're not, you know, executing people in the Coliseum yet. Um, but, you know, we have bread and circuses in the United States. So and, oh, really? you know, all the stuff that's done just to maintain the empire. It's a very complex system. It's large and bloated. So, you know, they're coming up with new lies and new propaganda, new manipulations and things like that. Um, we don't, just to we keep don't on, have a Roman Colosseum. I thought that's what the deaths for the newscasters were all about. Four newscasters in one week? That's kind of a Roman Colosseum, in my opinion. What do they all have in common? Exposure to what's going on in Iraq? Maybe knowledge of what ISIS was about? What was the Roman Colosseum with that uh, Manhattan railway explosion? More fin finance, not executives, but they were upper middle rank types. I think we have a Roman Coliseum. What about Bite Bart? I think I have his name right in San Francisco with his car going out of control with uh, usage of the chip to take over control of a car. I was amazed. I saw a CSI, you know, the original CSI crime scene investigation out of Nevada, Las Vegas. Um, Ted, uh, oh gosh, Ted Danson, or Ted, anyway. Ted Danson. Danson. Ted Danson yeah. and uh, Elizabeth Shue are, are the stars of it now, the imported stars. They needed some big names. I saw a show, I don't see many of them, but I saw a show a few months ago, and I was absolutely astonished. The, the perpetrator, the murderer, was a major in the U.S. military, and his method of murder was taking control of the automatic chip to kick, take control of the guy's car and to run it into a tree and to kill him. And when the investigators were, were following through on it, their car had its control taken over by the same chip device. Now, they're giving away their methods. They're showing us their tools. I mean, there was another one, in this, this Paul Taylor, Fast and Furious, he was involved in some uh, various fund fundraising programs and and uh, oh, what's the word charity organizations that were not exactly apolitical. And reports are that his car was taken over by a chip internally before the crash. The chip takes control. The car goes out of control. And and they you know it, it's like the same guys who control the drone aircraft are controlling the cars. 
and I don't know how they see. I don't know how they know where they're going. Maybe they've got cameras on the, the streets, or maybe they've got a camera in the car that's also hidden. But uh, this is the Roman Coliseum in my book. I think we've got all kinds of Roman Coliseum hits. And, and not only that, you, you've got you know very important uh, banker mid-level types being killed. What, what are we up to, about 80-something mid-level bankers. This is Roman Col Hey, look, you know, just take away the Coliseum. This is Roman Coliseum kills. They're flying out of windows. Gosh. Oh, boy. So it's getting very dangerous, Jason. And, uh, you know, it gets me nervous sometimes, but I try to live by my, my guideline, which is, you know, touch on a nasty topic, but move away from it quickly. And also, don't get bogged down with the details. I don't talk about narco trafficking and where the accounts are and what islands or what countries or who does the mule trafficking and who carries the bearer bonds to uh, the Vatican to satisfy whatever. I, I don't have all the roots, the accounts, the players. I don't have it all down. I don't want to know. I just know that the Wall Street banks, without the narco money trafficking and all the cuts that they receive, I'm curious what the cut is. Is it 15% or is it 30% of all moved money? I think it's closer to 15, not sure. But I know for a fact that without that money source, Wall Street banks, the big money center banks, would have uh, shut down illiqui illiquidity bankruptcy in 09 and 10. And even the United Nations confirms that. So I'm not crazy. My uh, my next couple of questions, Jim, before before I let you go, have to do with the euro. Um, do you think Greece is going to leave the euro, and then the euro is going to break apart? Do you think Germany is planning an exit to leave the euro, or do you think they're going to stay in the euro until maybe um, they have this uh, this next global financial system finalized? Well, that's a big question. Um, I can only give you rough strokes, but I think the rough strokes will have a lot of meaning. Greece is such a big debtor now that they are a partner to the European bankers. You know, the old saying, if you have a big enough loan, you have a partner. You don't have a client. You have a partner. Because if they go down, you go down. That's what Greece is now. So the big bankers in Europe have two choices. And, you know, when I say Europe, I don't exclude England because the London banks are involved in this because they're backing up the European banks. So they're in line if the dominoes start to fall, and so is Wall Street. But if, the, if Greece says, we're just going to default, we don't like you guys anymore, we don't want to lose any more assets through seizure, we don't like you guys anymore, we don't want you in our, in our faces, we don't want you to tell us what to do with our budgets, we don't like the unemployed from the austerity program. And besides, we've got a new government now. We're, we're the Syriza government. We've got a coalition. Now, you know, it, it's a little shaky now. It's being stressed. But if they just say, we're going to default on the whole damn thing, you're going to get very quickly three or four or five big European London banks go bust fast, fast, very fast. All right, second alternative. The Greeks say, well, you've got to forgive some of the loans, you know, at least a third, maybe a half of our loans. Forgive them, and, and, and we'll try to work and restructure the rest rather than to just you know, say bye-bye to the whole damn thing and cause big problems. And even France's finance minister has said, we support partial forgiveness of the Greek debt. So there's some support there. If you do that, let's just say it's a third. Well, even a third would cause at least one or two big bank failures. And then, then the dominoes start. Okay, so let's, let's then say, what's a third alternative? A third alternative is they continue doing what they're doing with more really silly patchwork done, extensions to the Greek debt, lowering maybe of a little interest, attachment of a few more assets. Look, they're, they're running out of the prized assets. That's one reason the, the Greeks are, are, are up in arms in the streets demonstrating against more and more and more because they don't want to lose the rest of their assets. If you, if you complete this game, Greece will lose Greece. They'll lose all their assets. So there's a lot of unemployment. And if they continue with more patchwork, 
all they'll end up doing is having a bigger debt burden to deal with next year because the austerity program, which I call poison pill, results in more economic distress, no economic development, more unemployment, and bigger deficits. So Greece is now in a strange, ironic way in the driver's seat. So when they have negotiations, they might have one or two European finance ministers on their side of the table for a while, but they always end up on the other side, on the banker's side. They might preach some platitudes or have a, a bout, a, a fit of common sense, but they eventually go back to their cabal side and, and back up there and support you know, the asset seizure and austerity. There isn't a single example, Jason, of an austerity budget program put in place that results in an economic rebound. They all result in worse decline economically and worse deficits. Well, that's because it's not real austerity. Then they're not they're not cutting tax. They're not really cutting spending as much as they say. They're increasing taxes and they're not really cutting spending. They're just it's just a decrease in the increasing rate of spending. So they're not you know they're not putting money. <clears throat> they're not cutting taxes and allowing entrepreneurship in Europe and allowing um, you know making it easier for someone in Europe who has some savings to not pay as much taxes and go start a business and come up with an idea. It's just, it's just not that easy to start a business in Europe in most of the countries in Europe compared to uh, other countries. I, I believe in a number. Of, I, I just disagree slightly, not, not you know, in a big way. I think there are many countries that have austerity programs where there are a number of budgets, a number of projects that are just cut. Now, th there are some, some pet projects that slow the increase. I agree. But there are some that just get cut. They just... They, 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 they're ended. They're gone. Now, as for Germany, Germany is a totally different game. Pardon me. Germany, I'm told last June, made agreements in spirit with the Russians and Chinese to exit the European Union and to work out an alternative to the euro currency. So they want out of the euro union politically and the monetary union. And, and I got I got news for folks. Uh, look for a very big battle at the Rammstein NATO base in Germany. Very big battle. It's like a city. It's a military base. It's like a city. So <clears throat> last June, they made their decisions. And it's interesting now to watch Merkel talk. Uh, for months and months, she'd just, you know, pair at the party line, the EU commissioners, by the way, the unelected European Union commissioners, and all the elected presidents and prime ministers report to the unelected tyrants, the commissioners. It's all backwards. It's called totalitarianism, folks. They've got it already. Can you imagine the U.S. president reporting to a North American commissioner? No, we can't even imagine it. Well, that's what Europe has. And that's what we call now normal. That's not normal. So the Germans, with their leader, Merkel, have been talking about, oh, you know, the nasty Russians are invading Crimea. What a crock of crap. Okay, but they've been talking about it, and then they've been following through with the sanctions. But now, when, when Russia came back in the other direction last, what was it, September or August, and said, we're going to have a ban on all European food and meats and agricultural output. Whoa, everything kind of changed inside Germany. Because, again, they have over 3,000 businesses doing, companies doing business in Russia. So now you're seeing the economic pain. And you're getting some strange things like U.S. propaganda writers putting out German publication fiction that certain company leaders regard their economic losses as worth the cost when they never said that. There are a couple of examples. I, I reported on in the hat trick letter last fall. <clears throat> I don't have the details in front of me, but I, I did my best to try to follow through on that. Are you sure that this big conglomerate leader actually said that in Germany? And I heard, no, no, he didn't say anything like that. That's, that's authored in Langley. <clears throat> um, so Merkel is not behind the Russian sanctions. 
she's following through on her oath of office. Few people realize that both the Japanese and the Germans have their top politi political leaders uh, swear an oath of allegiance to the United States government. They don't cross. So Merkel's just doing her job parroting the, the sanctions and the anti-Russian rhetoric. A couple of things have happened in, in you know, recent weeks regarding Germany, and one has to do with the pipelines. Merkel actually said, this is following Putin and Gazprom stating that they're going to bypass Ukraine and go through Turkey. It's no longer called South Stream, it's called Turk Stream. Fine, they're getting commitments and they're, they're beginning work as far as I understand. And not only that, they've, they've informed the Greek officials, this is beautiful work, they've informed the Greek officials exactly where from the Turkish border it will touch Greece, what the specifications of the pipe will be, and what its volume flow will be. In other words, get ready. So Greece is going to be part of this construction. Merkel said, we'll support whatever the current plan is. Okay, that's, that's a significant position to state. The second thing uh, is, is happening. It's not out of Merkel's mouth, but it, it's out of Germany. And it, it, it's statements by their finance minister, their economic counselor. Um, I mean, they've got a staff in their cabinet, too, like any you know, strong nation does. They've said... We must preserve and sustain our Russian trade. We worked hard for, for 30 and 40 years to develop it. We're not just going to sacrifice it. And now there's a prevailing sentiment in Germany. The war is a lose-lose situation. There's no winners. We need to stop the war. So there's a, a, a truce movement. And then you had the, uh, the Minsk Accord that took place just about three weeks ago. Uh, Merkel and Hollande, the president of France, was invited by Putin. They met at Minsk, the capital of Belarus. The uh, Ukraine puppet fascist Poroshenko, Poroshenko was there. And <clears throat> a lot happened. I don't want to get into all the details, but after a lot of preliminary meetings, uh, Merkel and Hollande were convinced this war must stop. And they're, they're now actively trying to stop this war. And the only parties that are actively promoting the war is the United States, which was not a, even invited to a truce conference. Can you point, Jason, to a single example in the last 100 years where the United States was not part of an international truce conference? I cannot. So there's a very big movement now. I think Germany is turning against the United States. They've left the EU in spirit. They see that the dollar is doomed. They don't like, hey, look, the Bundesbank is a very strong, reputable central bank full of integrity. If I were to name, you know, five central banks in the world, easily I would conclude the German Bundesbank is the most reputable, the strongest and, and the most responsible. They don't like what Draghi's doing at the Euro Central Bank. They don't like what the... The Fed is doing with QE. They don't like any of this QE. And I think they're developing their indictment list to, to leave the European Monetary Union. That's what I think is going on. And, you know, the Bundesbank is behind their departure. They don't want to have anything to do anymore with this euro. They don't want it. They don't want the dollar. They don't want the euro. I think they want to go to the gold standard. And, you know, some people wonder, well, why in 2011 did the Germans request their gold back from New York and London and maybe Paris as well? And, you know, I get some really blockheaded comments come my way. My gosh, that's all their gold. No, it's not. It was 300 and something tons of gold. They have almost 5,000. It wasn't even 10% of their gold. The Germans are in firm control of over 90% of their gold. They didn't lose their gold, people. They lost something like 7 or 8%, or it's, you know, in transit. <laughs> It'd be in transit for a long time until it shows up. 
Or deep storage, yeah. Deep storage, yeah, right. Well, I think it went straight into the, the COMEX and LBMA to, to satisfy requirements, and uh, so they didn't have a default. So why did the Germans demand in 2011, 2011 why did they demand repatriation of their gold? I heard from, again, the, the same contacts who told me about the Germans being now – I don't like the word in cahoots or in league because it, it makes it sound like it's subterranean and illegal and Al Capone-like in a mafia. They're in cooperative talks and, and uh, constructive platform building with Russia and China, the Germans are. They were told in 2011, early, several months before the repatriation request, they were told by the U.S. State Department of the plans for a war in Ukraine. And they said, are you out of your minds? So they asked for their gold back. Now you're getting a string of, of countries that are asking for their gold back. The Dutch, the Austrians, the Germans. There'll be more. So Yeah, Jim, Jim that seems everyone asking for their physical gold back or asking for audits of the physical gold. It's not the exact way the London Gold Pool in 1968 collapsed, but it seems very similar. Yeah. Well, it's going to cause a lot of stress on the system. And furthermore, and in a very important point, it causes more attention for the gold corruption led by London and New York. The gold corruption must be exposed. And that's why I like mentioning the Scotia Makota story. Uh, this, this, or Makata, I, 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 I sometimes get confused. at Makota or Makata? Makota, Makata, tomato, tomato. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have a funny way of, of remembering it. it it's going to sound pretty, pretty, pretty strange. But my, my, my girlfriend calls me a, a, a mucosa. Mucosa. It means a snot-nosed kid. <laughs> you know, like mucus membrane. <laughs> okay, so she calls me a snot. Mucosa. Okay, that's how I remember it. Scotia Mukata. The, the second vowel is an O, just like mucus. <laughs> I know it's kind of silly, but so what? We need mnemonic devices to remember these things because there's a lot of names, a lot of concepts, a lot of players, a lot of data, and a lot of wars. It's very hard to keep up with all the American wars. Yeah, and the euro just seems like a total mess. I mean, even if the Greeks get a restructuring, right, you have Italy and Spain and all the other pigs countries then who will start trying to demand the same stuff. So if they give in to Greece, right, then they're going to have to probably start giving in to the others, which could, you know, create a um, another negative feedback loop, you know, triggering derivatives uh, losses and bank blowups and things like that. Yes, yeah, so let me just give you some quick closing numbers so you appreciate that what happens in Greece will be requested and repeated in France, uh, in, I'm sorry, in Spain, Italy, and probably France, Italy has 60 million people. Spain has about 50 million people. France has about 50 million people. That's 160 million. Greece has about 11 million people. So, at least 10 times bigger a debt problem and solution and fallout from Spain and Italy. And if you include France, 15 times bigger fallout. So whatever happens, that's why these bankers are being very careful and, and stingy and rigid with Greece. Because they know Italy's going to just, you know, the, a week later, Italy say, we want the same. And they're six times bigger. So if you have a bank failure with Greece fallout on a default or a very big forgiveness and restructure, would you not have several banks failing in Europe and London if Greece, Italy, Spain, and France all go down and restructure? Ooh, this is why Greece is so important. Greece in and of itself is not all that important. It's important as a model for the debt reconstruction or forgiveness or default. Yeah, I, I think, Jim, the European banks, a lot of them would have already defaulted without the currency swaps that the Federal Reserve has been giving the ECB and European banks, you know, since I think like 2009 or 2010. So there's been, you know, just so much backdoor bailouts, but, you know, their losses are just hemorrhaging more and more and more that um, even the currency swaps, I think, are not enough now. Well, I think that in addition to currency swaps, there's a little bit of narco money trafficking uh, cuts being given 
because many of these biggest these biggest of European banks, they're just filthy dirty with the narco money trafficking. And, uh, you know, all these reasons that we stated here, all reasons why people should own physical gold and silver, and if they have the money to do so, they should keep, you know, dollar cost averaging regardless of what the stupid paper, uh, stupid paper price does, um, which is, you know, the, the stupid games in the stupid paper markets. These banks are going to go down. The paper markets and paper wealth is going to go down. And really, about the not, – not the only – about the only asset left standing will be gold and silver. Uh, and in addition to, say, commercial properties and farmland. And, and when you get this argument, this is another moronic argument out there that I, I keep hearing. Well, there's not enough gold out there to cover all the money. Well, sure there is. There's too much money, other way around, too much money to cover the gold, to be backed by gold. Therefore, the money must go down in value, a devaluation of money. And therefore, you must have a tenfold rise, a fivefold rise in the gold and silver price. It must double, triple, up fivefold in order to cover all the additional money that's just been printed since Lehman Brothers. Yeah, I agree. We should be looking at triple before all this is said and done, because I don't see any way they can keep the game going without creating massive amounts of more, you know, fiat currency out of nothing. Um, I think we're going to see triple digit silver um, probably in the next uh, seven to ten years. Oh, I think it's a guarantee. A hundred is a, a, a low point in my book. Uh, I, I've got I've got some indicators from my colleagues and reasons why. And I I've been on other shows to explain the various steps. But, you know, we, we must close down the COMEX. We must close down the London LBMA. When that happens, we're going to have a, a quick search towards some kind of equilibrium to bring about, you know, Opening up some of the gold mines that shut down because they can't make any money. That's just a starting point. That's not equilibrium. And then when you have the actual new money systems coming in that are gold backed, like you know, there's a lot of talk about the, the gold backed, gold and silver backed BRICS currency. I don't give any twit of, of viability or credibility to the IMF super sovereign bullshit that Rickards likes to talk about. Remember, von Mises talked about sound money, and he has a corollary that's very important to remember. A paper-based system cannot replace a broken, debt-saturated, paper-based currency system. Paper cannot replace paper. Only gold can replace paper. And then later, they'll just ban the gold, do what they did in 1971, and have paper replace the gold. No, you cannot have an, a super sovereign basket of IMF money replace the current Forex system. It's not going to happen. And, and you're not going to get any gold backing of the IMF system. The big players don't want to have anything to do with them. That's why they're building all the other additional systems like the, the Asian Infrastructure Fund, uh, the, the New Development Fund for the BRICS. The currency crisis reserve, CRA, crisis reserve, you know, asset fund uh, for the BRICS. The new debt rating agencies are going to be for the BRICS. The, the MasterCard replacement, they, they got this uh, uh, China card, what do they call it? Uh, Union Pay. And there's a Russian card. It's got four four letter acronym. It's, it's not a clever name. It's got its own acronym. So they're building the systems to avoid the, the current power structure and platform. They're not going to rely on IMF. If they, if they rely on IMF in any way, shape, or form, I believe it's to permit it to very publicly fail. All right, so when they come up with these new, uh, the new BRICS currency or whatever is a legitimate gold-backed currency or series of currencies that later becomes like a BRICS consortium, of gold-backed currencies, which is another possibility, you're going to see another quantum leap in the gold price. And then the final quantum leap in the gold price will come from the urgent need of the Swiss bankers to replace all the gold from the allocated gold accounts that they have stolen. And it's not yeah, stolen Jim. out. 
Yeah, Jim, and even Alan Greenspan, now that he left his job at the Fed, now he's even saying the gold price should rise. So um, I, I think that's telling that, you know, these these low gold prices, there's just too much demand for gold. I mean, look how much physical gold. I think since in 2013, China took out more than 100 percent of the physical gold mining supply. 2014, they did it. They're on pace again in 2015. And that's not even counting demand for Asia or India or Russia or any of these other countries that want physical gold. So something has to give soon. The gold price has to go higher or um, the miners are going to shut down. And then we're going to have, you know, a, a big supply shortage in the near future for large orders of metal. Well, you can talk about all the official gold demand from the, the central banks that you want. I consider them small drops in the bucket. Uh, the Voice is part of a very elite group that since March of 2012, for approximately 30 straight months, removed 1,000 tons per month from London and it went to points in Asia. 1,000 tons per month under pressure of legal prosecution under probably some, I don't want to, I don't know exactly, but under some maybe shadowy pressures, shall we say. And some of the gold shipped from the London docks came from Switzerland and came from Vatican. So Basel and Vatican helped this out and relieved London of its pressures because I believe, this is what has been indicated to me, I believe that London was the site for a lot of illegal, improper, and illicit usage of Asian gold, ancient family Asian gold sitting in London. The money, the, the, the gold bullion was improperly used to set up the euro. All the different Maastricht Treaty, all that hubbub and, and arguments, what was overlooked was the illegal usage of mainly Chinese family gold with Forex derivatives, tying the gold to the various currency prices. And they, they basically got the rug pulled out from them by the, the older Chinese and Asian families. And that's why London had to forfeit a thousand tons a month. So you could talk all you want about the Chinese official gold reserves going from a thousand forty five tons and gee it might go up to two thousand tons this year. Try twenty five thousand tons. You could talk all you want about the Kremlin and their central bank moving up their official gold reserves I don't care. It's a drop in the bucket. Try 20 to 25,000 tons of gold. Together, Russia and China have over 40,000 tons of gold, more than about, about six times what Fort Knox had. You think that's enough to back a new gold and silver BRICS currency or group of BRICS currencies? I do. Yeah, it definitely sounds like it. And you think then in the next five to seven years, for sure, they'll have that system implemented? Or do you think it's going to take sooner or later? I don't have a and timeline that. on it, but I was assured that the clock will start racing after the Chinese New Year, which was uh, the 19th of February. Now, it's pretty hard to say we have an acceleration of events. I, I think we've got an acceleration of activities behind closed doors. For instance, I'll just mention one. The Chinese had a date of the Chinese New Year. It was the 19th. It might have been the 17th, but it was right around the Chinese New Year, where the United States was obligated to honor what they, what they sometimes call legacy U.S. treasuries that are close to 100 years old. And the corrupt U.S. financial managers, being criminals, said we won't honor them because they're too old. So China said, well, okay, we understand your position, and we're not going to tolerate it anymore. We're going to start shutting down piece by piece your national economy and system. The next thing you know, there's a dock worker strike along the West Coast. Next thing you know, there's a lost funding for Homeland Security. So we're seeing some strange activities. And I don't even want to get into the uh, West Virginia incident of a truck 
tanker. <laughs> Do you believe that story? <laughs> oh, I, I didn't see it, so I can't comment. Okay, on that. well, you believe that. You probably believe the Aurora, Colorado and incident in the movie theater, Batman. You probably believe the Sandy Hook. You probably believe the Boston Marathon. You probably believe every cock and bull story that's come out of the U.S. government with their actors, their crisis actors out of a Florida guild. And you keep seeing the same people. Gosh, the, the lawyer for that flaming red-haired guy in the Colorado incident from two years ago, the same woman was a lawyer there as a parent in Sandy Hook. Gee, how can that be? Hmm. <clears throat> Christ. Well, I, I definitely know we're not... I definitely know we're not being told the truth. I mean, it's what Ron Paul says, right? Uh, truth is treason in the empire of lies. So. Yeah, I, I like that. That makes a lot of sense. I, I have a different, similar saying that treason is the calling card of these fascists. Well, um, I, I think that's good to wrap it up, Jim. You've, you've given our, our listeners a lot of interesting stuff here on the Euro and Russia and a lot of geopolitical stuff behind the scenes. I mean, it's a lot more than... Then the uh, CNBC and Bloomberg people talk about, oh, oh, these are all fundamentals moving the markets, right? Pretending there is no market manipulation and stuff like that. It's just ridiculous. I can't even listen to CNBC or Bloomberg anymore. I really, I don't even check the stock tape that much anymore for prices and stuff because, like, I'm just fed up with hearing their their uh, their uh, their excuses and their comments about, oh, though this was natural market action and oh, markets are efficient and all this stuff. Now talking one iota, you know, about financial repression or market manipulation or anything like that. Well, I remember back in 2003, they said the gold price was rising from all the Palestinian stress. <laughs> hey, by the way, I got a question for you. What, what's CNBC? You mentioned that. What is CNBC? What do you mean? I, I, I my memory is fading. I. What is CNBC? I you, you mentioned that. I, 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 They're mainstream financial media. Like oh, Bloomberg. oh yeah, oh yeah. I'm sorry. I haven't seen it in so long. You know they have like the what? pretty they, they have the pretty girls on there that just report whatever they're told. <laughs> that just oh, read the script. Joke. I, I used to watch it. I stopped watching it about five years ago. And they don't in Costa Rica here. They don't have either CNBC or Bloomberg anymore. So you know I'm ben benefiting from that, but. I did like Mandy, that Aussie little hottie. I thought she was nice. Oh, yeah, Mandy Drury? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, um, I, I think that's good to wrap it up here. We're, <laughs> we're at about an hour 20 here. Talk about girls offline on the podcast. But um, you have a girlfriend, though, so it might not be a good idea if she listens to your work. Oh, she, <laughs> she, she, anyway. she considers the American women of, of a different class. Oh uh, yeah, they're they're pretty. They're uh, I live right out, outside of GC, DC, Jim, and they're they're pretty Marxist and spoiled. A lot of them, you know, they they hate capitalism and entrepreneurship and a lot of business owners, and yet they want very expensive stuff and they love Obama and basically they're a lot of them are Marxist uh, here in the United States now. I don't know if that's through brainwashing or did they just you know they just don't like um, having to work hard to uh, you know improve themselves. Well, that's that's one dimension. I think the Latinas here don't feel any competition from the American women because. Anyone who's over 200 or 250 pounds is not a competitor. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> there's, there's skinnier American women who, who starve themselves. There's a lot of American women who starve themselves. There's a lot of eating disorders. It's very high in the United States. And plastic surgery is super high here in the United States, too, for people who, like, you know, don't want to work out or eat healthy or anything like that because all the food's processed and disgusting. So, uh, a lot of the food. So is the drug intake for depression. What is it? Thirty percent of American women are now on medication for depression. Yeah, yeah, they're uh, everyone's on medications of some sorts here. The doctors here don't do. My my dad's a retired doctor. The doctors here just tend to not really do a lot of uh you know old type of doctoring, where you know they recommend non uh prescription cures. Almost everything now is like here. Here's five prescriptions. You know, even if you have like one little thing wrong with you, here's the five prescriptions. Um, yeah. that tends to be the way doctors heal now is they just they give out prescriptions for almost everything it's kind of ridiculous yeah i have uh, prescriptions too vitamin c vitamin e uh my <laughs> saw palmetto garlic uh msm chondroitin complex sulfur uh, yeah i have lots of vitamins they're, they're, yeah, they're, I, I they're take... my medications right 
yeah, I take a lot of supplements now and I eat, I try to eat paleo most of the time. So I, I try to have like grass fed beef and um, organic fruits and vegetables. But um, the cost on those things, the food prices have just gone up here a lot in the United States. And, you know, we have the, the mainstream people on the Keynesian say, oh, there is no inflation. Well, look at your food bill. And, you know, they try to excuse it away that there is no inflation in food prices, even though, you know, the, there's enormous inflation in food prices. The only thing that's going down in price that I can see is gasoline. And that's yeah, and also also electronics, but that's a free market though. So you know, digital cameras and computers and stuff. Oh, yeah. that's a free market. I mean, yeah, yeah, production. Yeah, so okay, well, it's yeah. good being on, and uh, I hope people go to www.goldenjackass.com, take a look at the free material, and sign up for the hat trick letter. Great, and uh, we'll have you on again in a couple months, Jim. Thanks.